Okay. Um, um, no more uh, comments about elections. Right. No more comments about <laughs> elections. Trump is. <laughs> okay. I'm going to introduce John really briefly. I have known him. He won't appreciate me saying this, but I've known him since the early 1990s. <laughs> I remember emailing with you back in the day when email was not very efficient, emailing with you from Dusseldorf. Um, and, and since then, John has not been drawn into too much into phonetics, and he's still true to phonology, to L2 phonology, which is not the case with the wider L2 speech community. A lot of people are getting very involved in phonetics and um, phonology rules. So um, over to you, John. Give us your latest about phonology in L2A. Okay, well, thank you very much, Martha, and to everyone at Newcastle for the invitation. Delighted to be part of this. And yes, there will be a phonology theme. So whether that is, you know, true to my original goals or something about dinosaur status will remains to be determined. The title that you see here is a very long title and uh, Universal Architectural Properties of Complex Representations at the L2 Phonology Syntax Interface and looking at some of the implications of contiguity theory and match theory to try to reveal something about the properties of this particular interface. But I think a shorter title that, um, okay, the space bar doesn't work in advancing my slides. Ah, okay, but it, so phonology is the key. So again, looking at the role of phonology in these, um, the kinds of knowledge that second language learners um, set up when learning an additional language. And so this, the idea of GenSLA or generative approaches to second language acquisition, I think would be broadly familiar to a lot of people in the virtual room that were concerned with things like language learnability, which are constraints on grammars to show that, you know, with our genetic endowment and the input that we're exposed to, we can acquire or converge on a particular grammar we need very, uh, let's see, realistic and sophisticated models of the target phenomena to be acquired. We try to address broad philosophical questions from cognitive science about how do we come to know what we know. And this idea of grammar as knowledge, again, with input, as Martha said, from phonetics as perhaps part of the learning theory, the role of the environment in, in setting up this kind of knowledge is important. And we need to try to account for both property theories of this grammatical knowledge in the phonological domain or any other domain and transitional theories that can account for why the learners move through the stages that they move through. And all of these things together as the modest goals of generative second language acquisition, try to take into account or weigh the contributions of language universals, the role of the input, the role of computation, the role of general cognition in accounting for all of these important things. Now, more specifically in either L2 or more and more these days, L3 or LN phonology, there are certain core areas that I think have been more addressed in the literature than others. People have looked a lot at the acquisition of features, syllable structure, stress, tone, um, to a lesser extent, though, again, since I have known uh, Martha, looking at the prosodic hierarchy, to try to take these again as the models of what have you got in your L1 that might transfer into the additional language? What are you trying to acquire in the additional language in this particular domain? So there's been a lot in this um, core areas of L2 phonology. We also see, just again to, I think, remind ourselves in the background that there are certainly poverty of stimulus effects in the acquisition of L2 phonology, just like we see elsewhere in acquisition problems. So whether we're talking about things like features or onsets or codas or moras or feet, these don't come reliably labeled in the input and certainly not cross-linguistically. There's not a robust acoustic cue to a mora. There's not a robust acoustic cue to the feet that we could say that the learners are just watching out for looking to notice these kinds of things. And perhaps counterintuitively, 
even things like features are not, again, robust, reliable cues crossed linguistically. And if you take things like if you would argue that you might have a plus or minus voice feature in a language, that in some languages, the actual laryngeal vibration is often uh, neutralized entirely. And you may get the more robust cue to voicing being something like vowel length in the previous syllable, previous nucleus or something like that. So I, again, elsewhere, I've certainly argued that features too need to be learned, that all of this stuff needs to be learned. It's not just noticing. That L2 phonology is not just noticing stuff in the environment and using that to set up a representation. So arguing that we need, uh, again, learning theories, we need to treat L2 phonology as a learning problem and come up with a learning theory that helps us understand what our learners are doing. Now, aside from the core, there have been Again, a, a rich literature looking at various grammatical interfaces. People have looked at the phonetics phonology interface. People have looked at the phonology morphology interface. People have looked at the phonology syntax interface and interfaces with other cognitive modules, whether we call them uh, pragmatics or general cognition. And of course, you know, within a, a kind of uh, consensus minimalist architecture, if you're just looking at the interaction with conceptual structure and motoric systems, you're, you know, there's all recognized that phonology does interact with these other systems. And that's the focus that I want to take today is to, to highlight a, a couple of data sets of looking at some of these interfaces. Now, People within second language acquisition, of course, have looked at these interfaces, whether it's Sirace's work on the interface hypothesis, um, Slavakova's work on the bottleneck hypothesis, Godin White on prosodic transfer. People have looked at these interfaces to account for a variety of facts, whether it's, um, say, Sirace looking at optionality uh, largely to say why certain phenomena are more variable. Um, Slabakova in her bottleneck hypothesis, uh, addressing the familiar question of what is easy and what is difficult in second language acquisition, why inflectional morphology might be difficult. And with a slightly different take on it, um, Heather Goad and Lydia White looking at difficulties in inflectional morphology because of phonological reasons. So I'm certainly not saying that people haven't looked at these interface properties with phonology, but I think these are some of the uh, main areas that I'm building upon. So I said in my admittedly long abstract that I present you with two data sets, and this is the first part, okay? So part the first of this talk, which looks at a paper that uh, Nicole Croteau and I did recently that um, looks at the acquisition of Japanese WH questions, second language Japanese WH questions. And I'm working within a model of uh, contiguity theory. So this is Norvin Richards' model of contiguity theory, where Richards looks at WH words and what licenses WH words to remain in C2. And Japanese, I'll give examples in a second. Japanese doesn't require overt WH movement, but according to Richards, there are strategies that are available to achieve contiguity. And one of the strategies to achieve contiguity is phonological contiguity, all right? Where there's no prosodic boundary between the WH word and the question particle. And so my broad question in this was to say, well, how do English speakers do when trying to acquire this property because as we know and will see, English has WH, English has overt WH movement. And to leap to the conclusion, no foreshadowing here, but I'll give you the data and arguments. What we showed was that these are L1 English subjects had achieved phonological contiguity as demonstrated by their pitch compression patterns between the WH word and the question particle. And this really does, I think, evidence a rich phonological recursive hierarchical structure in their phonology that is certainly counter to anything like the shallow structure hypothesis. And we can see that phonological representations are richly structured as well. And again, this fits into my theme that it's not just a matter of noticing because there are actually two phonetic properties that are related to 
Japanese WH questions, and the learners get one of them, they get the phonological one, and they don't get the other one. They don't get the strictly gradient continuous phonetic one. And my argument is that if it's just noticing, we would expect them to notice both pitch phenomena equally well and to acquire both pitch phenomena equally well, and they don't. And I think it's a structural reason that um, leads to that. Now, Richards, in a couple of books and some manuscripts, argues that there are sort of two blueprints that languages can follow to achieve contiguity. That he says that languages like their uh, question particles and WH words to be somehow close together. And in English, the strategy of contiguity is linear adjacency. So there's movement that moves the WH element to be under the uh, question particle node. That, and in Japanese, you get a couple of other things going on to achieve phonological contiguity. There's actually, we'll see, there's a boost, a phonetic pitch boost on the WH element. And then there's a compression. There's a flat prosodic profile between the WH word and the right edge question particle. All right. So what Richards argues is that these are two strategies for languages to achieve contiguity. English uses one strategy and Japanese uses another. So it struck me as a good case study for second language learners. So again, uh, a particular tree structure of a WH question in English where the WH word is going to move from uh, it's you know base position lower down on the tree up to be in the uh, next to the feature. And so whatever theories we have about why you know why it moves for Richards, it's for contiguity, right? So it's not strong and weak features or anything like that. And in Japanese, again, you note that you get right headed, you get the question particle on the right edge of the sentence. You get the WH word in the middle of the sentence. So this is uh, Nayo, uh, what uh, drank at the bar. And you get the WH word base generated in the middle of the sentence and it stays there. But what we'll see is that you get a compression, a phonological compression between that WH word and the right edge question particle. We had uh, nine self-assessed advanced learners of Japanese and, uh, and some, let's see, uh, intermediate, seven intermediate subjects as well, 12 native speakers of English as a control group. And we were looking at uh, their properties, both of their pitch boost on the WH word and of their phonetic compression between the WH word and the question particle. It was a read aloud task where they were given 19 sentences in advance. They could rehearse their reading. When we recorded them, they were allowed to repeat if they made a slip of the tongue. At the end of every sentence, they were asked if they were satisfied with their recording. And when they said yes, we saved it. And that was the version that we used for analysis. So they would read something like this in the two scripts. Again, we wanted to make sure that um, the task was doable and would read something like the WH version, what did Noyoya drink at the bar? And what I would call the DP version, Noyoya drank something at the bar. And we'd compare the pitch patterns on these kinds of sentences. And what you see um, in, I'll say, either a native speaker or as we'll see some of our non-native speakers, you get the pitch boost on the WH word. So you get a pitch rise here as indicated by the blue line. And between the WH word and the question particle, you get a very level pitch contour before you get a rise on the question particle at the end of the sentence. Right? So this is the target phenomena that we see evidenced in the native speakers. And as I will argue, um, it's the target phenomenon we're looking for in non-native speakers. And we're going to see that the non-native speakers do different things on the pitch boost than they do on this pitch compression, all right? So what about the pitch boost, all right? So we, the native speakers do a pitch boost. Um, we can get into it. I think there's some dialect variation that we did control for in the native speaker population. Not all Japanese dialects do this pitch boost, but ours did. And so this, we would control and compare the pitch boost on things like Noburu, uh, brought pizza and what did 
Taro bring, okay, to see what the average pitch across all subjects on these controlled comparisons were on a DP phrase like pizza compared to a WH phrase like what, all right? And we compared them and a range of statistical tests uh, performed within generalized linear mixed modeling showed that there was no significant difference between the pitch on WH word and pitch on DPs, right? So that they were not acquiring, they were not significantly differing uh, their pitch, the non-native speakers weren't, their pitch on the DP phrases and the WH phrases. Right? We'll come back to some things about that. So this is in particular three sentence pairs. There were no significant difference between the sentence pairs that had a DP versus a WH and those are in semitones if the pitch was measured in semitones we'll get into that sort of thing and overall on all of the sentences you see again the mean pitch levels of 12.9 semitones versus 12.8 semitones that these non-native speakers were not making a difference between their pitch levels on wh versus dps we also used our linear mixed model to account for these re repeated measures on the same subjects, and it revealed no um, significant differences between the WH and the DP. So what of the other levels of prosodic structure that we want to look at? If I you know, probe, I think, the real issue of phonological contiguity to see whether these interlanguage grammars are constrained by phonological contiguity, we fit it into work of, again, a consensus model of a hierarchical prosodic structure and look to see what this can tell us about our second language learner behavior, where phonologically, we'd have this idea that we'd have nanio, no mia de don, no, all right? So you're looking at, this is the, the WH phrase, and you have these minor phonological phrases, one for nanio, one for no mia de donda, and then the largest phrase, you bring in the question particle at the end, no. And so we can have phonological structure where we have uh, phonological words grouped into phonological phrases. And if we went up to the highest level to the CP, it would be an intonational phrase. We'll get there a bit later. But we're going to be looking at how the syntax and the phonology map together. And this is where I think that the work that um, Lisa Selkirk did on match theory which broadly speaking is the assumption of syntax prosody isomorphism. And there's been some nice work by Emily Elfner on the syntax and phonology in Irish that has drawn on this. And I think it's also uh, revealing of second language learner grammars. And again, I'm following Richard's assumptions of match theory on his version of the syntax phonology interface. What it says, is that the preferential mapping is between XPs and phonological phrases and between X zeros and prosodic words, all right? So again, again, CPs are mapped onto intonational phrases so that the initial assumption would be that at the phrase level, you've got a phonological phrase, at the head level, you've got a prosodic word, all right? And we'll see how this tells us some things about both about the Japanese learners and the second data set on intraword code switching. So if we took kind of a, I think, bare phrase structure is kind of structure to reveal simplistic details, something like shallow structure, which would have a phrasal level and a couple of heads in it, let's say, would have uh, a couple of prosodic words, shallow and structure, grouped into a phonological phrase, all right? So we assume this initial isomorphism between phrasal uh, syntax and phonological phrases and the heads and the prosodic word. I'll come back to Luis Lopez's work later, but I think Luis Lopez also does nice work, again, trying to draw on some of these uh, connections. So this would be an idea uh, within Japanese where you'd have a CP uh, be an intonational phrase, TPs and DPs and little VPs would be phonological phrases. And then down at the, well, let's call it late insertion stages, you'd have the prosodic words uh, coming in. All right, so that would be the general architecture that would be assumed. And the domain of prosodic contiguity that we want to look at is really between, you know, to have this, what Richards calls the WH phrase, 
where you get various things merging together. But at this level of structure between the complementizer and the WH word, you have no major phonological phrases, right? So you have phonetic compression between the WH phrase and the complementizer. That's what licenses WH and C2 for Richards. And that's what we find in our second language learners, all right? And here are two picked at random, but you'll get more generalized statistics uh, shortly. And one learner, you know, half a semitone difference, well, almost a semitone difference uh, between Nanio and the question particle and subject 15, very level pitch between the WH word, WH phrase and the question particle. And so from these individual data points, you see that the learners were keeping their uh, pitch level between the WH word and the question particle. And let's look at a more generalized statistical analysis. The other pattern that we would expect to see is that we would expect to see a declination of pitch before going up to the question particle. So you'd expect from if word one is the question word, and then word two and word three are words that follow the question word, we'd expect word two to be lower in pitch than word one, we'd expect word three to be lower or equal than word two, and then a pitch boost up on the question particle. So we tested that to see whether that was happening. And it was, we certainly see with word one and word two, that there were um, pitch drops between word one and word two in terms of, you know, and it was a, a, a significant difference so that word two was significantly lower in pitch than word one. And the same was true of words two and three and words one and three, all right? So that there was a declension, a decline uh, in pitch as we go from the WH word to just before the question particle. Was it native-like? Well, no, it wasn't across the board, all right? So that these second language learners were native-like in their drop from word one to word two, all right? So right after the question word, there was a drop to the um, word following that, and that was a native-like drop. The other decreases in pitch were there, but they weren't within native-like variation parameters, right? So the, my, the second language learners had accents, not surprisingly. These were, yeah, I probably should have said that. These were subjects who were learning, you know, classroom Japanese in Victoria, Canada. And so these were classroom learners of Japanese. So we'll come back to these implications. I mean, it, this isn't taught in class, all right? Um, so, but we would certainly expect them to have accents but the phonological contiguity stuff is not on the intermediate and advanced Japanese curriculum. And so what our linear mixed effects analysis showed is that they hadn't acquired the pitch boost versus DP distinction that native speakers had, but they had acquired the pitch compression pattern that native speakers have between the WH word and the question particle. And I think it's telling that certainly this property of Japanese WH questions is not taught in their classes, right? So we, if this is something that is found in their interlanguage grammar, we want to ask, where does this knowledge come from? It's not um, the source of instruction. So it's not, they're not getting feedback on this. It's not an effective instruction. And if it were just noticing the input I, my interpretation certainly is that we don't have a noticing theory that could tell us why they would notice pitch compression, but not notice pitch boost. So I think it's certainly consistent with a position that these interlanguage grammars are constrained by properties such as contiguity theory, match theory, that the learners are seeking to have prosodic contiguity of their WH in C2 licensing. I think this argues against exemplar models and I think is um, 
illustrative of the value of within subject research design because these are the same subjects who were look you know if we were looking at the pitch boost with one group of subjects and the uh, pitch compression with another group of subjects it'd be hard to have everything controlled to compare them but within a within subject research design we've got these are the same people who are doing this and the two phenomena behave differently now i'll go kind of i mean it's skim through this a, a little briefly. I think I'm doing okay for time within, you know, 10 to 15 more minutes remaining in my talking to allow time for chatting and questions at the end. Um, after his second book came out, Richards has a, a manuscript where he, I think, explores some of the learn learnability uh, conditions that underlie um, acquisition of contiguity theory. And so he's saying, well, what are what are the cues that would tell someone about what whether they should, you know, allow WH and C2, whether they're looking, whether they need to move, or whether they um, whether their grammar allows the WH phrase to remain in C2. And he argues that it really is phonetic prominence that is the cue for the syntax. And so this gives puts phonology into the driver's seat of the syntactic phenomena about whether you get how the goal phrase and the probes move, whether the uh, languages are right active in terms of their phonology. I'll give you examples in a sec, or whether they're left active in terms of their phonology. So what Richard says is that the goal phrase can't remain in C2 in a language that's left prominent. It must move to be adjacent to the question feature, the probe, in a prosodically left active language. And English and Japanese are both phonologically active on the left, but Japanese is head final, English is head initial, so there's going to be a learning task, a learning challenge here. English learners of Japanese would initially transfer their left active phonology and their head initial syntax, so they'd have to change something in their grammar to achieve target like Japanese, and as always we'd ask what would tell them that they need to change. Well, once they shift to final syntax, the implication is that WHC2 is licensed because of the universal properties of contiguity theory. And what Nicole and I and Archibald and Croteau gave our subjects was a reading task that had clear indication of a right edge complementizer. All right. So no, we don't know for sure what they do in spontaneous tasks. All right. So this is a, a first stage to see what would happen in spontaneous tasks. But they've got a reliable cue in the task to head final syntax. And so again, that could have told them something that would have, they, they couldn't set up an impossible grammar, so they respect phonological contiguity. But I think this has interesting implications for bilingual grammars, for one, that phonology drives the syntax. And so this phonological property acts as the cue for syntactic learning via match theory and via the kind of cue-based learning that Drescher has built in as well. I'm going to skip through again these sorts of things. Um, okay, let me move on to the second data set that I think are revealing of the value of looking at the phonology syntax interface, uh, a bit of morphology phonology as well. And this is some data from intraword code switching. Now, all pretty much the you know lion's share of this keyword comes from a wonderful dissertation in Illinois that Sarah Stefanich did with Jen Cabrelli and others, um, where she looked at intraword code switching. And you know, there's a rich literature on code switching that looks at code switching within a conversation, within a sentence, trying to figure out whether there are uh, linguistic restrictions on where you can code switch. And up until S Stefanich's work, there was a lot of debate within the field about whether you could do a code switch within a word. And I think one of the valuable things that Stefanich provided was a wonderful uh, spreadsheet of uh, literature review to show that intraword code switches happen, all right? That you get, they're morphological switches. Undeniably, the morphology can switch within a word. And so uh, a Spanish-English example would be uh, a learner producing a sentence like voy a hangar con mis amigos, I'm going to hang with my friends, where, as you see, you get a word which combines an English verb root with Spanish verbal inflection 
these so you get hang and ar to create a mixed or code switch word it can include a root from one language and affixes from another and there's been again uh, some interesting work done by alexiadu and londal and a, a few papers uh, arguing demonstrating that the affixes only come from the language which generates the syntactic tree and the root can be taken from either language or any language if we're dealing with multiling multilinguals so there's fascinating implications here to look at you know root competition and all that sort of stuff but we'll stick with the idea that the affixes come from the syntactic tree what uh, Alexiadu and Landal I think refer to as the syntactic frame and then you get insertion of vocabulary items into category neutral roots and but these data strongly suggest it's sometimes hard to tell from the published data they don't always report on the phonology of these morphological switches but the data strongly suggest that the phonology doesn't switch all right so that you can have a root from one language and an affix from another language but it seems like the phonology stays the same all right and again it's the phonology of the affix language that we're going to uh, talk about and so in these kinds of examples, when we look at uh, a test that Stefanich did, both production tasks and acceptability judgment tasks demonstrate that having the English root with affixes from Spanish would be pronounced with Spanish phonology. All right, so that the phonology doesn't switch from the English root to the Spanish affix. And here's an example of the kind of task that Stefanich gave in her thesis. Um, the learners would be exposed to the following instructions. Repite, por favor. The English is in your brackets. Um, to mip, right? So an English verb, to mip. To mip, es cuando bailas, to your favorite song in an empty room. Angela lives in a studio apartment and she mips every night. ¿Qué está haciendo en la foto? Está... And the expected answer would be mi piando, not mi piando, even though the English root is mip. All right. So the, this is the production task. And we wanted to see whether the learners would switch their phonology from uh, a, a trained form of mip to mip piando or something like that. And let's look and see what we get. So in production, so these are e-language tasks, we get a single phonology, broadly speaking. There were some complexities in her work that I, yes, I'm glossing over, but I am confident in saying we get really no um, switches within the uh, root and the affix. So you get mipeando, you don't get mipeando. In the acceptability judgment task, there were different stimuli that were created either with all English phonology, which would sound something like mipeando, right, where I, you know, diphthongize the O, um, with a mixed phonology, which would probably be something like mipeando, all right, and all Spanish phonology, which would be something like mipeando, all right, and people would judge the acceptability with all, you know, randomized uh, stimulus design and to see whether which they preferred all right and they preferred all Spanish phonology all right so that the scale that I put up there shows that all English phonology got the lowest ratings all Spanish phonology got the highest ratings and the mixed phonology got the middle ground ratings but what I got wondering about since Stefanich and Stefanich and Cabrelli have, have done this work on morphological switches and non-phonological switches is, is why. And there is, of course, a, a literature that uh, addresses the why. So Jeff McSwan has had work for a long time trying to say, <clears throat> since the days of uh, Shana Poplock commenting that you couldn't get phrase uh, forms like etiendo, and you couldn't get certain intraword code switching. There's been a literature which tried to address why you couldn't. But I think we've certainly demonstrated that it occurs. You get morphological switches. And a lot of, so McSwan and Colina have tried to update 
again, uh, an earlier rule-based ban on switching to a constraint-based ban on switching. But I think what's in common with a lot of these models that, is that they assume a lexicist model of uh, grammatical architecture where the lexicon is pre-syntactic. And it, it really assumes that morpholo morphology and phonology should pattern together. And, but I think there's certainly over the past number of years, there's been very influential work in non-lexicalist frameworks, uh, Gonzalez, Bilbaso, and Lopez, Lopez 2018, Lopez 2020, um, that I think suggest that the data are consistent with a model like distributed morphology, a late insertion model, insofar as the vocabulary items are delinked from their phonological spellout, all right? And so let's look at what that might tell us. So we, we see morphologically mixed heads within with a single phonology. And there's a variety of conditions that I won't go into here, but there's a variety of, say, sociocultural conditions, general cognitive conditions that license code switching, right? There are certain situations where we switch languages, and there are certain situations where we tend to suppress other languages not getting into that. But when we can switch languages, it seems to be, again, this X0, that's the domain for phonological uniformity. And I think that uniformity of the word and phrase is consistent with this single engine account of distributed morphology, which predicts that the machinery that builds syntax is the same machinery that builds word structure. And so we don't see that the word is a barrier to code switching. And I think that that is what a model like distributed morphology would predict. We know a lot about non-selective access in the bilingual lexicon. The work that Ton Dijkstra and others have done over the years have shown that we don't shut down any of our languages. And following Lopez, we can argue that bilinguals have a single vocabulary list that contain the roots of all of the languages, but with no phonological information. And so we may get evidence of uh, root competition for why the roots get inserted. And there's a story to be told there that maybe things like, you know, dog and chien and hunt are interlingual allomorphs, and we're looking for root competition within these kinds of models, but I'm not going there today. But if we see, go back to our, again, uh, match theory, the idea that if you get you know syntactic phrases and phonological phrases and heads going to prosodic words, we see this monolingual assumption of a lot of match theory can be extended to bilingual architecture, as you know Gary Libin and I have done and others have done, by means of something like language tags. And so we don't need any special machinery. There's no special machinery for code switching. Um, there's no special machinery for making sure that the phonology is the language of the affixes. It just falls out from the structure that if you've got a Japanese CP that cascades down and you're inserting the affixes, that's where the phonology comes in. You may get some things going on in late insertion that you get English roots coming in sometimes. You can get morphological switches, but the prosodic word allows a single phonology. And that's, again, I think not a surprise for us. So I think this non-lexicalist model of grammar supplemented by a tightly constrained syntax phonology interface explains the morphophonological properties of interword code switching. So I think match theory does give us, again, insights into the architecture of these interlingual interlanguage grammars. And phonology is certainly an equal partner in terms of understanding what our learners have acquired. Now, my little coda here is just uh, on a lighter vein, sort of, I don't know, maybe you can decide how, how light it is, which is the you know phonology and generative approaches to second language acquisition, which Martha hinted at in the introduction of, you know, indicating that, you know, that, you know, here I am, you know, waiting, you know, still, still doing this. And so this, why the pariah in the, you know, generative second language acquisition field? Why have, you know, the, why has the football stadium not filled up with people answering these fascinating kinds of questions? And 
here's the later part. So here's a book, you know, by an anonymous author called Second Language Acquisition, not Second Language Acquisition of Morphology or Syntax or anything like that. And what do you see? Chapters on the mental lexicon and syntax semantics and syntax discourse and um, implicate, you know, a wonderful textbook. You know, I've taught things from this textbook, but I think we do, you know, negative ne evidence is always challenging, but I think we do have to note the complete omission of phonology from a book called Second Language Acquisition. More recently, a book with four authors, four authors, all right, called Generative Second Language Acquisition. And I give them their credit, which they did <coughs> respond to my Facebook chastising of them to say, we talked about the prosodic transfer hypothesis. So they did talk about why the certain inflectional morphology is lacking because of phonological reasons, all right. But again, very limited exposure to L2 phonology. Here's a book that has papers by Cynthia Brown and your own Martha Young Shulton and some other guy, but yes, that turns out to have been a book that I put together. And so yes, phonology comes in sometimes, but it's an old book, all right? And there's also a nice uh, more recent book that Neil Snape and Tanya Kupish did that has a lot on L2 phonology. So I'm not, you know, uh, tarring everyone with the, the same brush, but I think it's something that I wonder about uh, every once in a while. And as Martha talked about our, our long timeline together, at that first GASLA in um, Massachusetts, there were three phonology talks, I believe, and one of them was mine. And as the conference organizer uh, honestly admitted, we scheduled phonology before the party so that people would stay, which was you know fair but nice, right? And GASLA 15, which was 26, dear God, years later, there were two phonology talks and one of them was mine. And I have chosen to view this as my influence on the field as growing, uh, not that there is still a lack of uh, phonology talks at, at GASLA. And jokingly at the Boston University Conference, we would always say that the acquisition of syntax talks were in an auditorium and the acquisition of phonology talks were in a closet. And yes, I exaggerate. And I haven't been back to BU in a while and maybe phonology is in the auditorium now. So what gives? Why, 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 why is this exaggerated and flippant uh, picture emerged? I think that to a certain extent, there's been um, an influence of minimalist architecture where you know the focus really has been on you know, what merge can generate and the structures of syntactic rules and representation and then you get the uh in this y-shaped model you know you get things being sent off to logical form the conceptual semantic interface you get things being sent off to the motoric system and phonology always just sort of fell into getting sent off to be linearized and uh, you know even evolutionarily it sort of emerged late and was you know kind of an embarrassment but you didn't really have to get into it the real interesting stuff happened at the at the merge level and where merge came from but merge is there in phonology too come back and i think the other thing that is you know the influence of computational models of phonology where again whether you look at you know, uh, harmonic serialism, that there are some wonderfully rich models of phonology that, you know, deal with models of entropy and candidate assessment that really illuminate the, what you know when you know phonology and what you do. But again, the, the represent, you can see that it's a trade-off between the, the representational side or phonology as cognition, as opposed to phonology as computation, right? So I think that Personally, we, we need both. I'm not saying we don't need phonological computation. We do need phonological computation, but I think we also need phonological representation and phonological cognition. And I think even the, the influence in the field that even you know newer models of uh, Flegge's SLM revised and PAM L2 models emphasize phonetic categorization more than the representational structure at any of the higher levels of phonology. But I think that there is a way that we can, you know, recognize and keep bringing in phonology, phonology back into generative second language acquisition. And here, I want to think of it, you should think of it, you're the ambassadors to go out there. This is like gateway phonology, excuse the illicit metaphor. So we get the syntacticians hooked on phonology through these interface phenomena, all right? And then we reel them in and say, hey, you think the phonology morphology interface is interesting? There's a lot of other phonology. You think the syntax phonology interface is interesting? Let's look at all this other phonology. So there's a program of research. 
And I think that work in match theory and work in contiguity theory show that this phonology syntax interface is an important representational part of the architecture of grammar. And unlike phonology being a somewhat trivial aspect of linearization, I think for Berwick and Chomsky and their evolutionary work, <laughs> it drives the syntax. And if Richards is right in pursuing this, it's the phonological conditions that license syntactic behavior. And I think there's a lot to pursue in the acquisition side of this. So uh, Richards 2019 work as phonology as the licensor of syntax. So wrapping up phonology, it's generative, it's learned, it's representational, it's recursive, all right? Getting into the, you know, why it has all of these properties that should make it fit into generative approaches to second language acquisition. Um, I won't get into this. This is I have this little data set where we looked at um, uh, in, in, infixing in English and you need recursive structures to license the difference between infix structures between fan uh, bloody-tastic and fan uh, task bloody tick. And we've got an ongoing study that shows that second language learners can do this. All right. Second language learners recognize the difference between well formed structures that have recursive foot structure and they know which ones sound worse. So, phonology, generative, learned, representational, recursive, it is part of the generative. SLA approach. It's at the grammatical core. It's at the heart of the matter. And that is where I will wrap up today. So thank you for your time at the end of your day. Uh, I appreciate you sticking around wherever you are. And uh, I will open it up for general questions or Yay. discussion. OK, great. Yeah, and we, we gained about 10 people as you were talking. <laughs> Um, okay. Yeah, questions. I'll mute myself. I'll, I'll choose people, but then mute myself. I think and that I was a great. Not. It was a great. It was a great talk. Said everything I would have said, and more. A lot more. <laughs> yeah. Well, you'll see, Martha. I mean, I, I thought I'd prop up. You know, there's a familiar orange book back there of someone who was looking at prosodic structure uh, for a while and a long uh, time ago. <laughs> a long time, but yeah, the... it's still close to my heart. <laughs> okay, Anders. Yeah, uh, uh, so this question shows that I haven't read uh, Norman's Richards, you know, Norman's, Norman Richards' work uh, well enough, you know, uh, but, um, well, I probably uh, right, so, so it's, uh, it's really interesting that, you know, the stuff about uh, the contiguity, um, uh, the contiguity hypothesis of, uh, of WH and C2, uh, and WH movement, but so what about languages where there isn't any, which are WH and C2 and they don't have any question particle, which is lots of languages. He, he looks at a, a range of evidence of what tells you that it's right active or left active. So it's not only WH phenomena. Again, I think he, he what does he look at? He looks at pied piping. He looks, I think, at topicalization. He looks at a variety of phenomena, not just WH movement. Um, and I think e even in terms of, uh, say, the, the activity cues, they can be on things like your activity patterns on DPs. So whether you tend to have a pitch declension from the determiner to the noun or a pitch rise from the determiner to the noun, looking at cross-linguistic variation and those kinds of things to see what what the correlations are so he so looks at a range the, yeah what is left active and right active is, is that part so, of it the, so whether it yeah so left active would be higher pitch on the left edge going down and right active would be higher pitch on the right edge all right so you'd see an increase going to the right he has to be careful, and he is careful, in that, as we all know, if you look at, say, tone phenomena, like tone, it's not just like tone downstep, where if you look at high tones going left to right in a sentence, the high tone at the beginning of the sentence is higher than the high tone later in the sentence. Yeah. There is a general downdrift tendency. And so when he looks at left edge languages 
compared to right edge languages, you do see a, a downdrift tendency even in left prominent languages, left active languages. And he controls for that in his statistical analysis. So it's a, a little more complicated than I was originally presenting. Yeah, thanks. Okay. I think Lauren has a question. Yeah, thank you so much. This was really interesting. It's a lot to digest, so I'm afraid my question yeah. isn't very substantive. But um, when you were talking about in the Spanish with mipeando versus mipeando, mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if there's a reason to distinguish between code switching and borrowing, where I would assume borrowing would have um, that sort of phonological transfer built in, uh, whereas uh, code switching, this was an obviously an open question at the time. Well, no, it, it's, it's a, a question again at, at the heart of the matter. So there certainly are models like Myers Scotton who would say that borrowing and code switching are fundamentally different things. But the work, so Stefanich's work within say a distributed morphology account would use the same machinery for code switching and borrowing so that their, their view is that you don't need to make that distinction and that you just have the, and that so the parsimony view would say, let's see if we can account for it with one set of grammatical machinery. And they say, we don't need the distinction between code switching and borrowing. And yeah, the one, they looked at other things. They looked at TH, so the interdental fricatives to see whether there'd be switching. And here's the, I mean, a little bit more about the methodology of that. Um, in code switching phenomena, again, there seem to be, there are populations in which code switching is viewed as a very stigmatized activity and that it may mark you as a stigmatized population, right? So if you're, let's say a, a non prestige population, you might not think of code switching as a valuable thing to do. So th this, these data were collected in Chicago and it was all a, a population that were high prestige code switchers. They Code switching was a mark of your proficiency. There was a lot of code switching done in the population and things like that. And that's where she did find some variation, I think in the, uh, the TH examples there in that there were, there, was some, there were some people who had THs in their Spanish all the time and that sort of thing. So she couldn't, you know, it didn't, you know, behave as nicely as the E stuff, but it was because the, the population and their control data were doing something different. So she, I think she controlled nicely for that. Thanks. Anyone else? Hand? Have somebody, actually, I don't think he's going to ask a question, but um, Johannes Heim was in your neck of the woods for a while. Okay. Where was <laughs> Putting that? him on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Johannes? Yeah, more, um, I don't mind that at all. It was just that I was teaching um, beyond the starting point of your talk, so I'm not entirely sure that I followed all of it. Um, but thank you for, um, for giving it. It was basically a wide tour of um, language, second language acquisition and the syntax process interface. And I'm still digesting, especially what you said about match theory. I've never really thought about how this would apply to second language acquisition. So I really appreciate your, your um, input there. I was in your neighborhood because I was at UBC um, for my uh, dissertation. Oh, wow. OK. Well, close by, just across the water. But, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. mm -hmm. Um, is there a question in the chat? No, no. Your email. Somebody wants your email, <laughs> but I can just email them that. Okay. Yeah. Most of the rest of the people here are students. There is a question in the chat, though. There is a question. Ah, right. Okay. Yeah. Can you see the chat, John? Yes, I just opened it up. Okay. Um, so let's see, accent, learning oh, foreign about, language earlier, may have fewer yeah, impact. Yeah, yeah. Well, so this, this was, yeah, that one of the things we noticed, we had a, a mixed group of, and these were pretty much everybody that I looked at in the Japanese WH study. So I'll focus on the Japanese WH study. These were, let's say, late learners, all right? There were no heritage learners 
in the classrooms. These were people who were had taken, you know, first and second year and third year Japanese at university. Some of them had taken, had had some time abroad in Japan. I think it was between, you know, four months to maybe one of them had up to a year in Japan. Um, so that they were certainly all later learners. They weren't heritage learners. They weren't, um, uh, they weren't native speakers. And so I think that by looking, you know, if they had in fact achieved, if their grammars respected this phonological contiguity principle, uh, they were doing this as late learners, all right? And so there weren't age effects that were going on there. Now they were accented, as you see, I mean, so that they, they weren't behaving like native speakers in terms of their phonetic patterns, but in terms of their phonology, they were behaving like native speakers. So again, a recurrent theme in I think Martha's work and my work is that whenever you're asking questions about if second language learners are, let's call it getting it wrong, you know, not saying it like native speakers, native likeness is not the only bar to set, but ignoring that for now, we always want to ask whether they're not getting it right phonetically or not getting it right phonologically. So take something like stress, that if you, they could be getting the stress placement right say they stress the anti-penultimate syllable, but they're still implementing it phonetically in a non-native-like fashion. So they may not be reducing their vowel quality, or they may not be lengthening the vowel in a stressed syllable. So we could see profiles where somebody has got the right L2 phonology, but not quite yet the accent phonetic implementation side. And I think we're seeing a similar kind of thing on the phonological contiguity data, where they these late learners had acquired the L2 phonological properties, but hadn't acquired the L2 phonetic properties. Now there, we may see input effects, all right? And again, it, it, it doesn't come up in classroom instruction that, you know, I talked to the teachers, that was, again, I could talk to, I could look at the teaching materials and say, do you ever teach them about this? And Admittedly, the answer was usually about what. <laughs> so, uh, so I think you know that this wasn't a classroom effect, and uh, it was, I, I think, a phonetics versus phonology effect. So, thank you, Ruin. Anders, Anders. yeah, another question. Uh, so, yeah, so it was uh, you know really interesting uh, facts. The the um, the fact about the pitch boost as well as and 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 uh, the pitch compression and, and how that was how they picked up the pitch compression but they didn't pick up the the pitch boost so is that does that hold I can maybe maybe you mentioned this but uh, I missed it does that like do they stay at that uh, level then or uh, they just forever? Had, they don't, were... don't they ever learn to also do the pitch boost right I, I don't i don't know is the answer yeah. i bet i bet i bet they learn it so these were classroom learners you know third and fourth year students yeah. so my guess is that if i picked near native speakers and so i don't know who i can pick is neil yeah. snape a near native speaker of japanese i don't know but uh, uh, if i can pick you know people who are uh, john matthews uh, look at their uh, pitch boost on wh questions my prediction would be that the, these kinds of input effects take longer, that yeah. they're not unlearnable, but I would predict they get it. it but it may be, it, it, so it'd be a, cool, a great study to do, but also that the input may be more varied because not all Japanese dialects do it, all right? So oh. I think in Kyoto, it's marked by a pitch drop. So there's it's a change between. So I think, uh, so in our study, all of our native speakers controls did the pitch boost. So we were comparing them. But if the learners were exposed to different native speaker input, we might see different, we'd have to control for that. Yeah. Lauren? All right. Follow, yeah, to follow up on that, um, do you think, so you said that these were not things that um, were part of the pedagogy that they were being taught. Um, do you think that this is one of the things that can be taught in a classroom or, um, or 
if we sort of compare it then to like um, definite and indefinite articles, which are notoriously difficult to teach in a classroom, even when you provide deeper knowledge, they're just very difficult to, to learn. Do you think it's more like that? Or just, do you think that there's just this absence of, of explicit instruction and so they have to learn it implicitly? It's a good question. My, my gut feeling is that classroom instruction could make a difference because one thing that is a possible cause of this, I think they, what they are told in class is that certain kinds of questions have rising intonation, right? And so they aren't told about a pitch boost on WH questions, but what could you get for free might be good to test. If you tell them that there's a pitch boost on the WH word and you tell them that there's rising intonation on the question particle, you might have to have sort of a, a fairly level pattern in the middle. So again, you might be able to find a way of instructing that wouldn't have to get into talking about phonological phrases or anything like that, but you could talk about it in appropriate, appropriate classroom instruction language that might lead people, say, if, if they're being limited capacity processors, if they're focusing on a pitch boost of a WH word and a pitch boost of a question particle, the other stuff might come for free, but that would have to be a, that'd be a testable hypothesis. Yeah, I also wonder then if it's something that linguists with this sort of area of expertise um, then pick up faster. Because I, one of, uh, this sort of question intonation in Japanese was one of the first, my first introductions to any sort of Japanese linguistics. And it's always very, very much stuck with me because it's so interesting and, and different to what I'm used to. And while I know almost no Japanese, I imagine that I would be able to approximate a, a, an accented but present version of this should I get to that stage. But I don't know how much of that is just because I understand the linguistic component of it. Yeah, there's, I think there's, again, I'm, I'm not a Japanese speaker or Japanese linguist either. And that, I mean, there were certainly some situations where the native speakers had fallen intonation on the question particle. And in, I hadn't really got into what the, you know, the presuppositions are there that led to that or anything. So I think, you know, going further, I might need to know more about what leads to what circumstances gave me those falling intonations on the question particles. Because there, there were a, a few times when it came up, it was a reading task. There was no context given. I didn't, you know, set up truth value judgments or anything like that. There'd be, I think, you know, ways that you could explore this sort of thing, but yeah. Okay, more questions? I, I wanted to make a comment about uh, flege versus what you just said. And I, I, it might sound a little bit silly, but um, flege initially and maybe still basically says, oh, these phonetic categories are accessible across the lifespan and it's phonology where, and he doesn't actually say phonology because he's not a phonologist, but it's phonology where learners have problems. But what you're saying is it's not phonology, it's phonetics. Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think what I would agree. I mean, I think that where the phonetics comes in really is part of the, part of the learning theory. I think Fleggy would probably ag agree with that, but it has to do with, you know, what, what really becomes intake, if we can use that, right? Like that some things become intake easily uh, and there are conditions under which things become intake easily. And yet there are conditions where things do not become intake, things that bounce off our processors and we need uh, more input. We need more ticks on our frequency counter before it starts to get processed. And I think that, you know, in the, Fleggy's that response that he had in bilingualism and language and cognition a while ago, where he was essentially talking about age being a bad proxy for input, right? Saying that, you know, we, we saw, you know, throughout my career, he said, I found these age effects and we had kind of assumed that age was a good proxy about how much input you got. So that if you had an early age of acquisition, you got a lot of input. And if you had later age of acquisition, you had less input, but turns out that doesn't really hold. So we need to control a lot more for the amount of input. And I think if we get down to this kind of fine grained phonetic analysis, I think segmentally, 
it is true that you know you may get certain things that if you process ejectives in onsets like uh, 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 are a lot easier to process than ejectives in codas like ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Right. And I think that's a phonetic property that affects phonological acquisition. Right. And what it is about the phonetics of the pitch boost versus the phonetics of the pitch compression, I don't have a story for because I don't think it's just, I don't think that's a learning theory necessarily kind of question, but that you've got the leg up on your phonological expectations on one of them and you don't have any phonological expectations on the other. But I think that it is, it's a learning theory. Uh, that's a free, uh, that'd be a frequency effect. And I think Fleggy would probably agree with that sort of thing. Mm. I admit, I don't know his, that latest chapter that I don't think has come out yet. Um, the SLM revised, the SLMR, oh. where he looks a lot more at individual differences. And mm. I don't know what individual difference factors he'd bring into play here. But I mean, it may be again that general auditory processing comes into play. Uh, I would love to argue against that, but I know Kazuo Saito would argue for it. But I don't know. Oh, you have another question in the chat. Does the level vary between individual students? <laughs> Speaking of individual differences. Well, the the only difference we really checked was to see whether L1 made a difference, right? They, they were a pretty homogenous group. They were sort of third and fourth year students at the University of Victoria. Um, most of them were native speakers of English, but some of them were not native speakers of English. And they, so that they all had kind of the same, roughly speaking, they were university students. They had the same amount of exposure to Japanese. They had the same classroom instructors and L1 background didn't make a difference. All right. Now, um, their, uh, proficiency rating. Uh, it was a self-assessed proficiency. They either self-assessed their spoken proficiency as intermediate or advanced, and there was no difference between how the intermediate self-assessed group behaved and the advanced self-assessed group behaved. Now, that might tell me that they were not very good judges of their spoken proficiency, but I, th I think they were. I mean, that then, and, and this was, it was Meryl Swain, who was, uh, again, someone I worked with many, many years ago, had this, I think, useful phrase of bias for best. And I think this was a research design that allowed them to bias for best. They could read out, they had the sentence before uh, the recording, they could record more than once. And so if they couldn't do it on this task, that'd tell me a lot, right? If they didn't have fun, because this was pretty much the best setup they could have, and they did it. And so they could throw out sentences that they weren't happy with. And so this task, even though it was a rehearsed and a reading task, it wasn't really referencing any explicit or conscious knowledge that they had, right? And so, and it didn't matter um, what their L1 was. We didn't see transfer effects. Now, again, I had to argue this with some of the reviewers that um, it, it wouldn't have cared. I, I wouldn't care either way whether they transferred some things from their L1. Uh, what I was interested in was not L1 transfer, but ultimate attainment of L2, saying, you know, could anybody acquire this property of phonological contiguity regardless of what their L1 was? All right. So it's a separate but interesting question about what the stages looked like, but I was focusing more on the final state. Of well, of their of these subjects, grammars. Let's have one final question. Anders has been waiting for five minutes. Uh, Lauren's cat have might I? have a question. <laughs> Lauren, your cat is behind question. you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anybody? I know it's at the end of the day for you, so. Well, I did actually find that that. that a point you made at the very end about about recursive phonology. I haven't thought about <laughs> that. Uh, that is, I mean, I always thought of phonology is, you know, not recursive, and that's it. Oh, yeah, you have sort of a little bit of hierarchic structure in phonology. There's you know, the the foot has like a hierarchic structure, but the, and the syllable, 
but that's kind of just two levels of hierarchy. I mean, it's like a minimal hierarchy and 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 recursion. I didn't think there was any. But. No. So, so yeah. is there? So is it actually recursion, or is it just that you can stick a? a you can do it like once, but not. Can you keep? No, I think you, it, it is argued to be words. Recursive. Harry Harry Vanderholst has work on recursion. I think a book called Recursion in Phonology, and oh, uh, uh -huh. so you get you get evidence of recursion at all of the levels of the prosodic all right. hierarchy. All right. So, okay. No. Nope. Nope. There you go. And of course, so, infixing is always fun to talk about. So. <laughs> yeah, but use bloody, not the f yeah. word. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> uh, okay. I so yay. So. Yeah, I know. Yay, phonology. <laughs> Thank you so much, John. Okay. Um, and we'll all clap or people will use this. Well, well <laughs> and, uh, thank you all for coming. I appreciated it. And you know, yeah. enjoy the rest of your, enjoy your evening and your week. And well, I hope I'll see you, you at too. some conference somehow, Martha. And so, I think you will. I think yeah. we'll have a conference in Newcastle. Why not? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. And uh, I'm ending the recording now.